So I think it's not just my company, but it's, it's in a lot of companies. It's all who you surround yourself with. It's culture. So I was fortunate enough that I've met him and met other people that wanted what I wanted, a smooth run operation. And I just was fortunate that, um, to hire the right people. And I would sit down with, and I do this to this day, I sit down with people and I ask them, what is it that you want out of authentic hardwood? Because I realized long ago that everybody's got to get what they want out of authentic hardwood. If they're not getting what they want, they can't work for me. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, Adventure Team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. Do what you got to do. That's what we're talking about today, Alan. We got to cheers it up. Cheers, we got baby. a big one today. Yeah. You know what? I uh, I usually like to talk about myself. Okay. Yeah. Let's you talk about usually? No. You always. I do. Yeah. But uh, one of the one things I talk about, consistent theme that a lot of guys have heard me talk about on the show is is that CEO group that I'm part of. My my my, my mentorship group. I've been part of it for six years. Thank God for deal. them. They keep you somewhat in check. They do. I, I have to say that this group, uh, not only do they know more about me than my own wife, uh, but I've shared more with them and I processed some serious issues over six years. And um, I just think the world of that group, you know, uh, Chris Hanks is the guy who runs it. It is only local here to Atlanta. So don't call me and ask me. Um, hint, hint, Nick, Nick, hope, hope we probably will do something. Uh, and I may be starting something in about a year or so, so keep listening because oh, right wait, now you're wait, getting... wait, wait, that's a tease. Yeah. And by the way, you did mention Chris Hanks, and I for, forgot to go. Ah. Chris Hanks, who is Yoda? Yoda. Oh, what is it you seek? <laughs> is it the answers you seek? <laughs> is it? Are you asking the right question? Oh, he did that to Maybe me again the other day. Worked that off, off, off. Oh, sorry, worked that up off air. And so this is where we usually yeah. say, "Hey, uh, Michael, can you uh, fix it?" But we can't do that because, well, Michael never fixes it and cuts it out. So it's all in there. And this is what you call an authentic podcast, like Joe Rogan style, like getting before the That's election. A good word, authentic. We're authentic. You know what? It's way and better I, than and I dropped way a better Michael crusted. You know what I'm doing? Wow. You know what? You know what I'm about to do? I'm about to Slap mute somebody fucking mics. That's right. That's not, so I talked about Michael, and I used the word authentic, uh-huh. and I'm teasing even more about what we're going to do, because I might be getting a little excited. You thought I was going to say the word hard. Can't do that, people. This is not that kind of show. Go over to the sex channels if you want to listen to that shit, because we aren't doing or that Or our here. last episode. But... Or the last episode where we talked about caulk, and uh, we talked about decks, and having deck envy. But we're talking about hard wood. Is what I'm really talking about. I'd like to talk about hardwood. And why are we talking about that? Because hi, Chris. Because we have Michael Kerouac here from Authentic Hardwoods, who is part of my uh my CEO group. And I say mine because it's not mine. He is part of our CEO group. Uh he's been with us for a year, two years now. Wow, man, time flies. I mean, they're calling me OG now because I've been there for six years. And OG means still hasn't sold his business. <laughs> so <laughs> So I'm sitting there in the, not in the Yoda chair, in the, oh, look at that poor pathetic guy still running his own business, uh, digging through. But Michael has joined us. Uh, Michael Kerouac, Authentic Hardwoods here in Atlanta, Georgia, out of Norcross. But Michael ain't from here. He ain't from these parts. <laughs> Michael, welcome. Where are you from? I'm from Vernon, Connecticut, just outside of Hartford. Originally. Originally. But I moved here in 95, the year before the Olympics. I think that makes him a native. No, that makes him a, that makes him a carpetbagger. <laughs> I read that. You're a carpet bagger. But because but he well yeah, but I came to I came to North Carolina in 92. I live so Well, look that. at you with your fake 92. Outfit. You and Brian Kelly. You said, I've lived oh, here I'm... longer than I've lived in Connecticut. I have lived in the south in longer the, than I've lived in North. Yeah, yeah. Yet my accent has not uh gone away and I still sound like I'm from the UP of Michigan and you still sound like my friend you're from the northeast. Yeah, I'm definitely from the northeast. That's it, not going away. Now, no. when when you go back to Connecticut for a family deal, do they say you sound southern? 
So I was at a, a Home Depot in Connecticut, and the lady in there said, you're not from around here, are you? Really? And I said, what? I grew up in this town. <laughs> and uh, no, my accent still, to me, sounds like I'm from up north. My wife is from South Georgia with a real southern accent. How'd you guys meet? Uh, we met at a restaurant. Uh, we used to live near each other in, uh, in another area in Gwinnett County, and we just crossed paths. So you guys met at a restaurant? Yep. We used to say bar. But I guess not. I was going to say strip club, but I shouldn't do that. Should no. no. Okay. No, you can't do that. <laughs> Disparage his wife in the strip club. <laughs> Just now, uh, funny enough. Uh, no, I can't do that. All right. So, <laughs> you, you want to. I do too. Yeah. No. All right. Michael's not that kind of guy, man. No, he's, he's Michael's great. a good guy. He is. All right. So, let's Wife's talk about a this. saint. I'm just having uh, fun. Yeah. Well, um, is yeah, she, she is. Is uh, she? Um, yeah. Actually, should we know, have he, her here? She you likes know, bourbon, right? I, I would tell you, as guys go, he really talks very highly of her. He's never said, and I hope she listens to this podcast because this is true, he has never said anything but nice things and good things about how great she is. I got lucky. That's, That's pretty sure. awesome. We we all have outkicked our coverage, right? Yes, I uh, definitely uh, got it right the second time. Married that up. a boy. <laughs> all right, so, so we're not going to go into marriage counseling here. We're going to talk about this. So, Michael, you came out of high school. And you said, hey, I'm going to work. And did the work choose you or did you choose the work? That's the big one. That's a good question. I think no, for me, not. I think for me, it was I knew I was going to work hard. Um, I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't too good at school. So when I started sanding and refinishing floors, it was the first thing I was better than everybody else at. And I knew I was going to be good at it. And I... That's kind of a cool feeling, man. Yeah. So I, I picked it up quick. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I knew I was going to work hard. And I never really looked back. I always knew I was going to do hardwood with a goal of running to, your own bit. To see where it can go. All right. So why was it so fulfilling for you, 18 years old? And all right. So I'm good at something, which, I mean, that's a huge thing, right? Talk about a confidence boost because a lot of us. And we've talked about this. We still don't know what we want to be when we grow up. No. Yeah. And we're, you know, we always have that self doubt running through our head all the time. And we always think we're not as good as this or we're not good at this. But it's nice to every once in a while go, hey, man, I'm really good at something. So why was sanding and refinishing hardwoods, why was that so fulfilling for you? Well, I think for, you know, a, a lot of people that are trying to find their way at that age, you're trying to find out what am I good at? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? How am I going to make a living? And when you know you're not going to go to college, you start thinking, okay, what is out there for me? And I just uh, had a high school friend, his dad owned a flooring company. And when we got out of high school, we just went to work for him uh, by the hour. This was back in 86. And I just, I just liked it. I was good at it. I liked it. The older guys that uh, were running the cruise, they liked me on their cruise. I think because I was the guy they could yell at and boss around all day. But you get it done. But yeah, I got it done and I worked hard. So what was one of the one le- what what what's one of the best lessons you learned from being on the crew as the crew guy having guys talking because you just said something that I will come back to. But what was the biggest lesson you think you learned up from that crew? Do you have what it takes to start your own business? Are you tired of the 9 to 5 corporate job and ready to make that leap into entrepreneurship? You need to check out From the Zoo to the Wild, the book by successful entrepreneur, Chris Lalomia. This book is a unique perspective on the journey into the wild world of home services and delivering excellence in service while working in customers' homes. Lalomia shares his path to success in this industry, including proven customer relationship strategies, award-winning customer experience processes, and a unique approach to training a team of service technicians to perform at the highest levels. Whether you're a small business trying to scale or a franchise operation, From the Zoo to the Wild will give you the mindset, habits, leadership style, and customer-oriented processes to succeed as a small business owner in the world of home services. So if you're ready to take control of your future, get a copy of From the Zoo to the Wild. Today, available on Amazon. The importance of doing quality work. 
I had a guy, a mentor of mine that taught me how to do floors. Um, he was the, the guy who taught me when I first got in the industry and he really made an important fact. You'll want to do quality. Even if you don't feel like you're getting paid what you should get paid. A lot of guys in construction think they're underpaid. He really wanted to do a good job and he taught me, I was like an apprentice. So I remember I probably did floors for three years with him before I was allowed to run the big sander. I remember it was a crucible moment in my career when he said, today's the day. So he really <laughs> taught me from the very beginning, from the ground up. It's the, think about that for a minute, right? I know. I'm so, not worthy. Right? So it's like, it's one of those things like um, today you get to drive the car. Dude, what? <laughs> yeah. With the family in it? I mean, I can kill the entire family with one shot. Yes, Chris, you get to drive the car today. So, Michael, I can the grind a groove into this customer's Dude. floor that they will never get rid of. So, what what was your phrase? Was it hot rod or let's grind it? I mean, what what, what do you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I remember having a phrase for it. Yippee io! Yippee io! Kyle. Give me that thing. Giddy up! I do remember the stress level. Like I was like, wow, this is this is important because that was kind of like when I started running my own crew. And then it was pretty much on me to make sure the job came out right. And we're trying to sand and finish the furniture quality. And here we are. Uh, you said three years into it. But today we're, we're, we're talking, how many years have you been in the flooring business? 38 years. So 38 years. But who's three. counting? Well, but but this is it. Back to, you know, everybody wants that cryptocurrency. Everybody wants that. I looked over there. I thought you were flipping me off. No, I just have one finger up. I'm, because like, I'm my so fingers used are... to you flipping me off. I'm like, well, what did I do this time? Not, it's not pretty yet. early in the podcast. I know, I've been it's, nice. it's, so I'm just warming my fingers up for later. Oh, okay. So, it's just a little so, stretch, little but, stretch exercise of the thing. yeah. But but you know, go back to this. It'd be thirty eight years in the business, and we're going to talk about how successful he is today because it, it is an amazing business he runs. But three years into it is when he first got a chance to go. So it doesn't happen overnight, man. I mean, there are special. And one of the things that's really cool is that this year in WSJ, well, uh, that's Wall Street Journal, uh, Alan. If you're keeping track, is <laughs> thanks for um, they talk about me. your next millionaires are blue collar workers. So they're HVAC, they're plumbers, mm -hmm. they're electricians. And there was a whole article and my brother sent that to me and said, Hey, look at this. Your trades are in there. And I wrote back to him like, yeah, wrong trades, bro. I'm in handyman. I said, we ain't there yet, but flooring back to this. Uh, but what you did, I mean, three years into it, he found, he, he understood that it takes time to do things. You can't go from zero to a 38 million or zero to a millionaire in just six months. It takes time if you want to have a lasting business that you can actually put your name on and have a lot of pride in because I know Michael has a lot on it. And there's a lot to be said for just being really freaking good at one thing. Yeah, and, he is. And, and you actually said off air before we started something to the effect of, yeah, I've been in flooring my whole life. Isn't that, I can't remember. You said something. He said the word. He said, isn't that pathetic? And yeah. I was like, no bullshit. No. Right? And, I, and I, not, I think about, you know, you, awesome. you and I love to cook and there's people who devote their lives to pizza. Yeah. And they do, you know, their whole life is about pizza and the perfection of the pizza and every pizza is special to them. And then you think about the Japanese culture and you have somebody that devotes their whole life to just sharpening blades or, you know, or cutting fish or cutting fish. And I mean, we, we don't, we don't have that kind of passion in the States very often. I, I don't see that. No, and and I will tell you, and it's gonna, this is going to come out in this, and there, I I don't know how he came up with the word authentic, but th th this dude is authentic. I mean, Michael, I, I mean, love I love that name. So I yeah, lo I love that name. Yeah, um, and that's why I'm changing my name to the authentic, authentic toolbox. toolbox. I know because I would <laughs> I, I would just feel so much better about it. I mean, trusted toolbox. What? Oh it's come so right. I mean, you just like you just you and your pulled that out of a gumball well, the more machine. The more trusted toolbox got yeah, blown I know more right. trusted toolbox. So back to Michael. Way better than the trusted to toolbox. And it's enough about you. That's about Michael. Okay, back to Michael. Or, or well, it's Chris. really about. Chris. Let, actually, let me tell you another story. No, okay. <laughs> All right, Michael, back to you. So three years into it, you're doing that. You're still now. You're a crew leader. Um, at that point, are you thinking, "Hey, man, I think I can rock and roll. This is my biz. I'm going to start my own biz." Were you, were you actually starting to think about that at all? So I think probably five years in, I always thought I could do a better job running this company than than the way it's run. And I think a lot of employees have that employee mentality they can do better um but the issue is always um how do you get started in business and you know where does it all begin when do you take that big giant step um i think i had made a decision to move to georgia when i found out that the olympics was coming and i had worked for a company for about four years 
So this was nine years into it. And then I decided I'm going to go to Atlanta. I had never been to Atlanta, but I figured I'm going to go there. They got four seasons. Um, I know there's a lot of work there. You, Not moved, the hotel, you no. moved without ever having visited? Yeah, I, I'd never been to Georgia, never, nothing. So I came here, <laughs> and uh, when I got here in, in July of 95, um, I started calling around the flooring companies. And back then, business was booming. Builders were building houses. This, you know, They were selling them as fast as they could build them. Right. What I found out when I got here was the quality was ridiculous. The floor guy, one day- Ridiculous, he, bad. 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 One, one day, the floor guy's doing floors. The next day, the same guy's hanging sheetrock. The next day, he's running trim. There was no like true apprenticeship. It was basically like, here are the tools, get going at it. So I thought the quality of work was pretty bad when I got here. So I just thought I'd take advantage of it. And I met a guy, and he had tools- he had work, but he really didn't have a company. So I kind of just took that, took that role, him and I, and we got another guy. And um, he just didn't have the, the mindset of building a company. He was all about how much money can I make, the least amount of money I spend on my business, the more money I can pocket. And he just had a whole bad He was mindset. looking for the big go-fast boat. So we can go up on Lake Lanier with the big go-fast boat, Alan. Was his name Chris? It was not. Oh. I only have a pontoon boat. I don't have the go fast boat. <laughs> I, uh, but I, but I, but no. In I, your I, mind, you've got a cigarette boat. Oh, full of I, bikinis. Dude, when I, when I roll that thing out on Lake Nandahala <laughs> and I go end to end in my big old pontoon boat, I am all thinking I am Miami Vice rolling out right from the movie. 1982. I am just rocking it, baby. <laughs> I'm Don freaking Johnson and I, Tubbs is with me and we're rocking down there and I'm in my pontoon boat. <laughs> so, I did not get the boat, go fast boat because Michael's hitting on exactly what he's just talking about. This guy didn't know how to run a business. Well, Michael, what are you talking about? Well, Michael's talking about the guy wanted to get as much money out of the business as he could. Well, isn't that why we're doing it? Well, no, mm. not if you're looking for the future, right? Long term. Ah, mm -hmm. 38 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I get a sling blade? Sling blade. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. So, Michael, you got into it. You're working with these guys. Uh, you didn't know one person in Atlanta. I, I had known a, a person that lived um, on the west side, a guy I went to school with. But when I when I got here, um, I was staying in a, an apartment over in, uh, what was it, Duluth. And um, so I was working with this guy. And I knew that it was a dead-end job. And then I had met somebody, and he just liked me. And he said, if you had your own tools, I'll pay you by the square foot. As much work as you want to do. Well... I didn't really know a lot of people didn't really have anything else to do, but work. So that's all I did was I just worked. I installed all day long, sand, installed and sanded all day long, every day. And, uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. He was kind of like a mentor and he just said, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. It's going to pay off. And I was getting paid by the square foot. So the incentive was the more you work, the more you make. It was a pretty simple concept. But you were a single contributor, right? It was just yeah, you. It was just me and a helper. So you were yeah. doing it. Yeah. When did you make that change to running your own business? So, well, Not necessarily I, a year, but. Yeah. What, so what in, in 99, so I got here in 90, I got here in 96 in 1999. I, uh, I met this guy and he was like, Hey, if you had your own tools, had your own van, I'll just pay you by the square foot. So I went to Home Depot, I bought a saw, started bought, buying some equipment, and then I told my boss, hey, I'm, I'm going to try this on my own. And uh, I just said to my, at that time, my girlfriend, I said, hey, I'm going to, I think I'm going to quit my job. And I think at that point, I was- Is this the one that you met at the yeah, restaurant? Yeah, so now, um, now it's my wife, but at the time, girlfriend. And uh, so then I bought a $1,500 van. Uh, and Hey, no, note to everybody. Uh, the girlfriend, very supportive, right? Love that part. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, uh, do you want you to have talk a about that a little bit? Yeah. So, girlfriend, make sure you get the motorcycle now, and make sure the motorcycle doesn't die because you don't get to buy one after you get married, even though her entire family rode Harley's all their lives. And then you go to say, "Hey, I'm going to go get a, tr uh, a bike," and my father-in-law, who I thought was totally supportive of this, said, "No, you can't." So Michael, because at this point in the podcast, I have to secretly call his therapist and set up an appointment for tomorrow, and You're see yeah. now? if they can clear the schedule in the morning. So to this day. Yeah. So to this day, I still do not have my motorcycle. And now when I can, 
I'm too old and I, I, I can't do it. You know you'd hurt yourself. I would die. Maybe you could get a scooter from Mary. I'm not, get, maybe a mobility scooter. You know what? <laughs> actually, we're doing a podcast over there. We're actually, we're doing a TikTok on that one. So, all right. So again, girlfriend supportive of the business. And how about this, right? How about coming home and telling your wife with two kids in private school and a country club community going, I'm going to quit my job and start my own business. Um, so let me explain supportive versus not supportive for the group. Um, so when you're established in life and then you decide to make the move, which is what I did, it is a lot harder than doing it in the beginning. And then you're like, no, it's not, Chris. It was just as hard. It, it's still just as hard. So here's what I tell people. I don't care when you start your business. Do it when you're ready. But you got to be ready. And yeah. Michael is showing you right now and everything he's telling you, he's he was ready. Because you were ready because you followed it. You've been through it. You knew the processes. You saw the things that were wrong. And when you said, I'm ready to jump, you weren't jumping blindly. You jumped into what you knew what you were doing, even though you don't say it like that. But... So you jumped. Here we go. Yeah. So I think when you um, decide to make that change, it's um, failure is not an option. Um, I had a good source to get work, but the work wasn't paying well. It was, you know, 80 cents a square foot for as many square feet as you can body can put up with for a day. And let me let me interrupt you there. So when you're looking at you being a perfectionist and a craftsman, 80 cents a square foot might be good if you're just kind of hauling ass through the house. Right. Right. But you were taking your time. Yeah. I, it's funny you say that. Cause I, I was working for a guy and, and we were talking about people always complaining. They're not, it's just in the home service industry. They're, they're underpaid. They're underpaid. And, and I was like, you know what, if you, if you agree to do the job for the amount of money that you agree to, you should do the best job you can do. And not say, well, I would have done a better job if you paid me more money. The idea is you agree to it. So give it your best. Worry about the money later. If you find out that you're underappreciated, then you find another job. But what you can't do is say, well, I would have done a better job with that floor if you were paying me a dollar a square foot versus 80 cents. So uh, good news uh, is good. It was was such good advice. So the the good news is when I tell somebody I'm going to do their deck, I can't come back to him and say, well, you're you always want back it. to the deck. Yeah. Especially your deck. Yeah. Uh, Trim the bushes. Yeah. So the deck always, looks bigger. It always looks bigger that way. Um, you know what? The, your wife was over on my deck last night. I couldn't get her off of it. I was <laughs> like, oh my God, I had all these ladies on my deck. I couldn't get them off of it. All right. That's a blue comedy uh, uh, tribute uh, right there. Cheers to Cheers. them. Love that. But, but Michael, back to your point, it, it's, it's your, you're right. You're not a victim. It's your fault, not their fault. You're not underpaid because of them. You're underpaid because you didn't do it, and that's a great business mindset. Well, it's the employee that feels like they deserve a raise. Right. I'd be a better employee if you paid me more money. How do you give a bad employee more money to on, be a better employee? On the hope that they'll actually live up <laughs> yeah. to being a better employee. All right. So when did you start Authentic Hardwoods as a name, as a brand, and, and to build it? Today? 1999. So did that was. Did you, you think as, about trusted hardwoods at all? I did not think about because it didn't seem no. like it was. It was trite. Is that so? I thought and about this is where I mute and <laughs> guess what? The fingers are warmed up and they're right fucking there. <laughs> it didn't take you long to warm up the finger. That's so Asshole. fun. Why do I invite him? I don't know. <laughs> all right. So authentic. Why? Um, genuine. You know, real, not. I used to be the custom floor guy. That's all I wanted to do. Install raw wood, sand and finish. I didn't want to talk about pre-finished in a box. I didn't want to talk about luxury vinyl. If it was raw wood, I would do it. If it wasn't, I wasn't interested. I wanted to do the harder of the flooring trades. It doesn't take a lot of talent to open up a box, glue it to some plywood and call it a floor. So, so I focused, obviously as the artist in mindset. The yeah. Artist, I, I want to be proud of this, right? Absolutely. Uh, in, in my opinion, if you want real hardwood, then buy real hardwood. Don't buy something that looks like hardwood. But it takes a lot more talent to install raw wood, sand, and finish than it does to buy it in a box. So for a dumbass like me, how am I going to see that difference if I'm the customer compared to You'll see it when your floor has a plasticky finish to it because it's a sprayed-on enamel in a factory. And you'll see the difference when your dishwasher leaks and you need a box to fix it and they discontinued it and we can't fix it because china doesn't have it anymore aha he didn't bring that up but he did bring up china 
All right. <laughs> All right, back to back to Michael. So, Michael, <laughs> you were still. You I'm not sure what just happened here. Because <laughs> like, China brings. <laughs> Bad wood. <laughs> we, you know what? After after all this, we could actually say that and get away with it. <laughs> We're protected. That's Keep right. Keep the borders protected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. November five. All right. Back to this. Uh, so, Michael, you grew up, but you were still just you, authentic hardwoods. When did you start to figure out that you had to do better to grow? When did you start to figure out the scaling had to be more than just you? Because you were the exact example of the e myth that Michael Gerber talks about all the time. You were a great craftsman, but now we're going to grow a business. How did you do it? Good well, I think um, I had met a guy and he said, Hey, I need a job. And I said, I'll teach you how to do floors. So he was my helper. And then I think what was happening was people were calling. I seemed to be busier and busier. Um, and then I kept saying, I don't know if we're getting lucky with this work coming or if this is just organically we're growing. So I just decided, hey, I'm going to add another guy. And then I went and bought another van. And then I had one van. I bought a brand new van from Tom Jumper Chevrolet. It's a company that hasn't been around in years, but they're Sandy Springs, I think. Um, so then I had a van to install. And then I had a van to sand and finish. We called it Old Whitey. And big whitey, because there were two white cargo vans. And then... Um... All right, so stop right there, because we talk a lot about branding and marketing. And uh, we're going to go back and pick on Michael a little bit. So we had two white vans. So one of the big things I talk about with my company is I built the Trusted Toolbox. Great brand name and recognition. Almost as good as the more trusted toolbox. You know what? Can't. Which has failed. Um but not as good as authentic hardwoods. Yeah. He hadn't wrapped his vehicles. He wasn't thinking like that because somebody didn't tell him, hey, look, good idea. If you would have wrapped those things, people would have saw you. Those are mobile, mobile marketing devices. Probably would have got some more leads out of those. But you're like, I didn't need leads, man, because I was getting my biz. That's back to, I'm not picking, but you know, I'm, I'm saying that you know, for guys listening to the biz today, here's the th cool thing, right? When Michael started his business, there weren't podcasts. The internet wasn't around. None of this stuff was happening. We didn't know this stuff. I'm telling you, today, big big part that you want to do is if you're a big old, if you're an old whitey and big whitey, make those things authentic whitey and uh, old, new whitey, new new authentic. Or, I can't figure it out. But anyway, authentic hardwoods trucks because they actually make them look great. Yeah. Well, I think back then, like you said, it was an internet. I was just trying to make money by my business focus was how many square feet can I get done in it. In a week how many can i get done in a month so my thought process well with one van two guys can install 700 feet in a day imagine if i had two vans and four guys we could do 1400 feet in a day so that's really my mindset but i was still out there in these vans as much as i could be i never did marketing i never did any sales i never hired anybody to work in an office work came to me pretty easy but Someone would say, talk to me about marketing. I didn't want to talk about marketing because I didn't have time. I didn't want my phone to ring. I could barely keep up with what I'm doing. And at this point, are you selling to the end user? or you... Yes. Okay. Yes. Homeowners. Okay. Yep. And they're just totally vibing on your authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. It's all word of mouth. Right. But again, he's rolling around and, you know, looking back and I'm, and I'm not picking because he's already doing it now. It's everything's wrapped up and doing it. Um, but that's how you br grow your brand. But he also, back to the e myth, I'm a great craftsman. I'm becoming a manager, and I definitely don't want to give up on the control of that quality. Well, and, and he, because quality is all about that, right? Yeah. I, I can promise you, I've seen his work. It's all quality. Well, and so I'm, I'm dying to know because right now, at this point in the story, he's still got his hand on every deal. Every deal. And now we're how, getting there. Yeah. Okay. Because at some <laughs> point, you've got to let go. So I had a guy call me. He was about 19 or 20, and he said, hey, I, I'm looking for a job. I've been doing floors for two years. My boss is a drug addict. I just quit. Found my number in the yellow pages. I don't know if you remember the yellow pages. We're old and enough. and yeah. he, uh, I said, yeah, come on in. Let's talk. So he came in, and he was 19 or 20 from Gainesville, and uh, I liked him. Just a hard worker, and... Once I hired him, he really started to make me feel like, wow, if he could take over running the crew, 
I could step back. And he kids around and says, you stopped working hard the day you hired me. <laughs> um, I'm lucky to say and fortunate to say that he still works for me. Been 20, 20 years or more. That's fantastic. Yeah, started when he was 20 and he's 41. So he was your first crew leader. Uh, yes. First real crew leader that I trusted. Okay. And so where are you, where are you all these years later? I mean, how many crews do you have? So we work 22 people. Uh, we run six crews. He is now our operations manager. So he doesn't deal in, he deals hundred percent day-to-day operations. He does the schedule, puts the crews together and orders material. So how, how now, because you are like obsessive about floors and obsessive about sanding and quality and everything. How do you, you know, it's the, it's the bigger you get, how do you make sure that the end user is getting the, the product and service that you would have delivered yourself with you not being directly involved? So I think it's not just my company, but it's, it's in a lot of companies. It's all who you surround yourself with. It's culture. So I was fortunate enough that I've, met him and met other people that wanted what I wanted, a smooth run operation. And I just was fortunate that um, to hire the right people. And I would sit down with, and I do this to this day, I sit down with people and I ask them, what is it that you want out of authentic hardwood? Because I realized long ago that everybody's got to get what they want out of authentic hardwood. If they're not getting what they want, they can't work for me. All right. So, so your first crew leader, this is a very important, what's his name? It's Michael, more, more Michael Blocker. He got, he's got Michael and Michael. So I'll call it Roswell and I'll say, Hey, I need to talk to Michael. And they'll uh, throw me over to Michael. <laughs> I'm like, Hey Mike, I did. You, uh, no, the, uh, I'm like, no, 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 dude, no, I need to talk to Kerouac. <laughs> it's so funny. So, but he, he, he plays it off. He's actually very, uh, very played off and, you know, just really downplaying what he did. He's got a culture, and he found a guy who wanted to buy into his culture. He found a guy who wanted to buy into his vision and got with him. And, and he invited him on that journey. He didn't say, hey, this is what I got. He's asking people, I'm bringing you on this journey. If you want to go on it with me, great. And that's what you feel every time you walk into his facility. That's what you feel when you see his guys come into a site. That's how he knows. that. It's, well, he doesn't know yet because he doesn't know but he's learning to know that he can be even bigger than he is today. Well, I think that's true, but I think if you grow it, let the company grow itself without trying to force it is the, is an easier way of doing it. Although I wasted a lot of time because I was just beating and banging around doing hardwood floors and I had created a good job for myself. Up until 2016. In 2016, I had an opportunity to buy a commercial building. And I was in Lawrenceville, little, uh, what is a warehouse office space, glorified garage. I couldn't, no one would ever want to work for me there as far as office. It was just basically the office was the bonus room above my garage. Flex space. And I had an office, but we used it as a storeroom for sandpaper. And then when I bought the building, um, it got me in a part of town I wanted to be, got me over on 141 at Peachtree Corners. And then I bought a facility I could grow a company in. And we spent a lot of money, uh, invested a lot of money into it. And uh, that is really the big turning point for Authentic Hardwood. I think that's a, that's a critical point. And, you know, actually, this is why Alan, who has joined the podcast, got to give Alan props. If you have any commercial property needs in all of Atlanta, you know who to talk to. That's Alan Wyatt because he has actually helped out a number of people who actually touched this podcast, but we also know a number of people. You bought uh, your property before you knew Alan, so he'll get some grace. Okay, Alan? But uh, talk about that for a minute because the space became the opener. For you, I uh, as I've listened to you, and I, I really appreciate this, is that you went with Clark, another uh, great remodeler here in town, and said, I'm going to buy this space. It's a big investment for me. But I also see this is going to open up my business. And it allowed you to open up your mind and, and grow it more. Did, did you feel like that was it that did it? Um, you felt like you were ready? Yeah, I, I didn't know if I was ready. It wasn't uh, my friend Clark Harris at Innovative Construction. He had approached me and said, I... Building's too big for me, big, you know, too far over the skis for me to do it on my own. You know, I, 
I think you're the only, you'd be a good fit if we bought it together. And so I was a little nervous. Um, so I talked to my wife about it. She was, you know, really, you want to make this big plunge? Um, and I said, you know, I really think I should do it. And then on a personal note, right when I signed the contract to buy the building, my wife came down with cancer. So she was kind of hemming and hawing and kind of hinting around, maybe we should pull the plug and maybe now's not the time. And I said, you know what? I get all that, but this is an opportunity that's in, in front of me today. It won't be in front of me, you know, a year from now. Um, and then she was basically like, you know what? If And I kind of leaned in and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to realize a dream here. This is a huge moment for me. And so everything worked out. She was supportive and I bought the building. All right. It sounds like you're being very selfish there, but I do know that uh, he told he didn't tell the whole story. My wife had cancer and I said, screw you. I'm going to go buy the building anyway. <laughs> that's that's not exactly how it worked. Really? Okay. Thanks, that, thanks that, for that's clearing not, this Is that what you heard? <laughs> yeah. But, but, but he, he told it like that because, again, very self-effacing and uh, put, it, it puts himself in a, a good servant spot. Um, she actually said, if, if you think this is right, you know, I feel like I can beat this and we're going to beat this together. And she said, let's go do all this together. And that's what I remember from the story that you told me in the CEO. It's hard to make big decisions like that when you have life stressors. Dude, I'm telling you, uh, actually, uh, I, he, yeah, Michael even said, you're not gonna share everything, are you? I, mean, <laughs> I said, no, bro, I'm gonna hold up. But this is one, um, you talk about having crucible moments. You actually used that phrase earlier and, and. Um, I remember him telling the story to me and, and for me, it felt like uh, listening to him, that was a crucible moment where a lot of people would have wilted. A lot of people would have said, you're right. Let me just pour into you as a cancer patient and let me help you because I have to, because that's what we do. And, and, and together they made the decision that we can do both and we can make this happen. And that's what I remembered. And together they're stronger. Yeah. It, it's, um, I remember when Clark had asked me to do it and I said to him, I don't know if I would do, if I do this, it's really gonna, I'm really in the game. I got to really take this seriously. I got to really build this company. It's going to be a lot. And I said, and he says, well, why not? What's keeping you from doing it? And I'm like, I just, I don't know if I want to put in all that energy that it's going to take. I said, I already make more money than I thought I would make. And he said, well, you created a good job. That's all you've done so far. How about create a good company? Mm. So he kind of pushed me along. And uh, again, my wife's support, um, it, it, it became, it made sense. But again, nervous at the time because th this building was a whole lot more money than I paid for my house. And when was this? Uh, 2016. And how's your wife now? Great. Great. Thanks for And asking. a remission, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right? She's, yeah. She's awesome. His yep. face so, lit up when I asked 16, him. 16, like 24. That. Yeah. I mean, again, he's he's never said a bad word. Um, I, I wish uh, not. So anyway, back to this. I'll call um, therapist again. Again, back to your career life, right? Uh, Michael got into this business because his friend's dad had a biz. He uh, gets under this guy who pours back into him and says, I'm, I want you to focus on quality. You look at his arc over life and, and what he's done. He's like, I'm always doing the quality deal. He takes a chance. And then he has another mentor step in his life and say, man, open your mind because you can run a bigger business than you are today. And guess what? You won't be beholden to being behind that sander or behind that nailer every single day. And so here he is today, and that's where we're going to get to today. So today, six crews doing this. Here's his lifestyle. Here's how I hear it, at least is that he takes 75 trips a year. No, it, he takes a couple trips a year snowmobiling. He does other things. He went to Ireland with his wife, a uh, lifelong dream for the fam, and they went over there for two weeks. Yep. And all, all the while, the business ran just fine. Think about that for a minute. 38 years. Would you do that if you told yourself, 19-year-old self, hey, 38 years from now, I'm going to let you take seven, eight weeks uh, off a year if you will, not that, that many, I know you don't, but, and I'm gonna let you go do these things. And by the way, you're financially independent. Yeah, no, I tell you, it's, um, it's a great feeling when all the systems are working. I always tell people my company's run by systems that we created. We're run by systems that my employees help build. And all we do is hire people to fill the position, train them. So I want to go back to something you said earlier. Every time you sit down with a prospective employee, you ask them, 
what do you want out of authentic? What are you looking for in that answer? So that's a good question. Uh, I know what I'm is. looking for is someone that's score whatever. When when somebody says to <laughs> two me, two fingers today. That's a good podcast. That's a two, that's a two finger podcast. <laughs> that was <laughs> simultaneous. No, no, oh, I gave him one. <laughs> no, I got two from Chris. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the the thing about hard, hardwood flooring is an installer. It's a hard job, really hard job. So we try to find someone that realizes it's hard. Are you tough enough physically and mentally? It's more mental than it is physical. But if they say to me, hey, I want to um, I want to learn how to run my own crew, then we say, OK, we're going to start you at the beginning. You don't have to know anything. We're going to train you. We're going to put you in the right spot with the right person. And in about three years, you should be ready to go out and, and do run your own job site. Now, we have a guy that it took him five years. But everybody's different, right? He had a lot of things that were uh, keeping him, slowing, his, slowing his pace down. Uh, we've seen people do it faster. But what we don't want is the guy to come in and, and feel like he's a helper, He's the gopher on a job site because after a while they get bored of that and they give up. So the guy that only wants to be a helper, he's the one who doesn't want any responsibility. He's not going to last long. He's going to get sick of it. He could push a broom anywhere. So we want a guy who wants more responsibility and therefore we see it in them and we show them this is what, this is how you're going to get there. We actually have a track record to show when I say, Hey, this guy, that is your boss. He's, he's head of operations. He came here at $11 an hour, 21 years ago. He's now running the, running the whole company as mm -hmm. far as, you know, the, the, in the field. Um, so again, we, and then we have another guy that had been with us 10 years and he said, Hey, I, I'm getting older. I don't, what is the end game for me here? And I knew he wasn't going to be good for sales, so I said, well, you've got to position yourself within this company where you can bring the same value that you bring as an installer. So we talked about it and I said, hey, wouldn't it be great if you became our quality control manager? So what he's been with us, I think, 10 years now and he's in his early 40s. He liked the company, liked the way we were doing things. So his job is to basically go around during the day, check on all the crews, make sure there's no problems that need to be fixed. So he's an incredible installer. So if someone's having trouble with a radius stair tread or something, he can make sure that he show them how to fix it. Also, if he's trying to find problems before the homeowner does. And if anyone ever needs anything, they call him. Oh, we, we ran out of wood or whatever happens. He's the boots on the ground. He's out there in a truck rolling around town. And he's phenomenal. I mean, we could, I would not want to be in business without this guy. He cuts out all the heartache, solving problems all day long before, before anyone ever knows there is one. So what I am hearing is your employees know after talking to you that if they're invested in your company, you're going to figure out a way to take their talents and make the most of it. And there will always be a spot within your company. Yes, that's, that, that's my hope. Yeah, that, that's what that the plan is. So when um, I used to hire bookkeepers and I'd hire a bookkeeper and I'd say, oh, you're a bookkeeper. And she'd be like, yeah, so I'd pay whatever I want to pay. Then I realized that their books are terrible. I couldn't get good reports. So then I had another that's kind of a problem with the bookkeeper. Don't you think, Chris? Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, that. I think what we, happens is you have we talked just about this the over chat? the podcast. We have. Thank you, my friend. Chris has had problems with bookkeepers. <laughs> Michael knows full well. Exactly. I can't Did believe I, I didn't get a third CEO? finger on that when I was going for the trifecta. Right. Actually, I got so I got so flabbergasted on that <laughs> that, that you didn't get it. You know what? You're getting double. Oh, yeah, I, I, to I think we met when you were at the tail end of fighting through your That's bookkeeping exactly right. debacle. Yeah. I would tell you, uh, books are great when they run great, and books are horrible when they're horrible. And getting out of the horrible... <laughs> It's so hard. It's so painful to and, go uh, from Michael, horrible to right. good. Michael came in on the tail end of, uh, I had, I had bared my soul to the entire group because it was, uh, you know, again, I, it, so I'm going to ask this question, uh, not to go about me. You know, I'm going to do it. Uh, it's been a long time since we talked about you, Chris. Right. For the love of God, please. Can we get back to me? I can't no. believe uh, I'm still here. 38 years. Have you ever thought about just saying I'm done? 
No, nah, no. Nah, I tell you, 38 years in, I've never had it better than I got it today. And you never at any point in your life said no. Nah, so nah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why you have that. And I love this uh, about you, Michael. And I, I've, I've come to know you. So people out there, I would tell you guys, I left my corporate America job and I was making a lot of money. And I had an established lifestyle and I started my business late. And I had a family to feed and I had expectations. I had very, very lofty expectations. Three different times in my career, I have, and this is what I've shared with the group, I should have closed my business and said, no, you know what? I failed. I didn't do it. And uh, Alan will attest because uh, he's been part of this. And it's tough. But you know what? I'm not saying that my expectations were too lofty and I didn't. And I'm not saying your expectations were too low and you did. I'm saying you have to be realistic about what you're doing and how you're getting there. Because 38 years later, to do the to do the year you've had, I mean, everybody makes fun of me with my vacations. You know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can keep making fun of me because, <laughs> hey, motherfuckers, I'm going to the Rose Bowl and SoFi next weekend. So take that. Oh, okay. next weekend. Yeah. Great. So, Great. Uh, but but I but we earned it. We we did it. And uh, you know what? But we do we have more fun doing this? And I've uh, just got done telling my friends this. I have more fun doing these podcasts than I do playing golf right now, and which is crazy because I love playing golf. Because I love getting a chance for people to hear your story because you're not just authentic hardwood. You are authentic Michael Kerouac. And your Amen. culture is coming through, and it, it does. I it's mean, unbelievable. He's, he's built a great business, and he's built a lifestyle for himself and his wife, who I completely can tell he adores, uh, for both of them. So it's been great. So kudos, man, for doing yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think a lot of it is um, I had somebody years ago say we were trying to find a good fit for uh, back to the bookkeeping, and he said, stop trying to write a check to make your problem go away. He was like, find someone who's smart and nice and train them. So I decided I hired a younger girl out of college, and I hired a CPA had a lot of money to teach her QuickBooks. And between my office, her, and the CPA, we created a job costing system. We created our books became rock solid. And it was just an investment, but it was also hard work. So therefore, I also had to learn about QuickBooks. And you think, well, I'm just a floor guy. But it's so common, I think, for us to just want to write a check and make it go away. Once you start realizing if you do the heavy lifting, it'll pay off forever. If you just hire someone and write them a check, once they leave, they take their system with them. Mm -hmm. This way, this, this young woman has left the company and everyone's like, oh, I can't believe she left after all that. And I said, well, you know what? It sucks, but she didn't take the system with her. So all we had to do is hire someone else, plug them into the system. Our books have never been better. How about that? Roll up your sleeves and get authentic. I love it. That's the uh, story. All right, <laughs> Michael Kerouac. All right, I know if you're a flooring guy, you're dying to talk to this guy. So, Michael, how do people get a hold of you? I know you don't want to, but I know you will give back to everybody <laughs> who calls you. I think he because, probably wants to. You know what? He does because he's got that servant heart. I mean, you 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 can't hear this through the whole thing. So how can people find you, man? So uh, AuthenticHardwoodFlooring.com. Let's do it. AuthenticHardwoodFlooring.com. And we'll come up with a jingle for him later, but we got to get to our <laughs> famous four questions. Let's do it right now. Ready to rock and roll. Give us a book you would recommend to our audience. Um, Don't be afraid. The Highest Calling. The Highest Calling. Oh, my gosh, by Larry Janeski. Yeah, phenomenal. Oh, that's the first call on that one. And by the way, Larry Janeski uh, started uh, Basement Systems, and uh, I was given that book by a big mentor of mine. Uh, Tom DeGregoria, shout out to Tom because he will not be listening to this because he has sold his business. He's actually getting a second bite of his apple right now. Uh, he is killing it. That's not so bitter. We... I'm not bitter. I mean, he he gave me a ton. Okay. But The Highest Calling by Larry Janeski, I 100% agree with Why? that. Why? It just talks about, it's actually a story about a guy trying to transition from being an operator to an owner and what it really means and what it really takes. And... uh and while I was reading that book, I had said to a mentor of mine, I said, I had, he had made a comment and I had said, ah, you know, I'm just a, an uneducated floor guy. 
He was like, no, you're not. You're a highly educated floor guy. Yeah, he is. He puts himself he, he, and then very like kind of how the book goes. Pretty yeah. powerful. Michael is uh, very self-effacing, but all right, we got to get back to this now. Ready? What's the what's the favorite feature? So I ask us? one one word question of why you're out. You think I'm off the rails? You were off I'm just the rails. Totally out of control. Oh my god! Crazy. He's going left again. Oh my god! America's done, I'm done, like, done. Double finger you. Oh, you can't do that because you're drinking. All right, back to this. <laughs> what's the favorite feature of your house? The floors. What's the favorite feature of my house? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the <He's> floors. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so it's a podcast. You have to answer. So why are your floors so good? What 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 is it? What do you got on the floor? What's in Michael Kerouac's authentic hardwood? I have uh, just your typical traditional hardwood floors, the two and a quarter inch wide standard. But I have a custom blended stain that I think really fits a craftsman style house that I have. Oh God, that sounds really good. Oh my God, that sounds like the guy describing dessert. I know. We have this dessert, and you're like, oh my God, I want to eat that. I, I don't even know what it looks like, but I want it. Me too. Yeah. Can we eat it? <laughs> Maybe. All right. All right. Back to this because we have to get ready to. We, we got to go eat soon. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are big on customer service. We have talked about that. We know what you guys do. Mm -hmm. But when you're out there and you're the you're the customer, what is a customer service pet peeve of yours? Because by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, but we are customer service freaks. Go. Say that question. <laughs> what is a customer service pet peeve? When of you're yours? the customer. Which I've seen that. You're out there. You're at dinner. Oh, as the customer. Yeah. Oh, just not showing up when you said you're gonna. That oh. aggravates me. Like with no like so if somebody says, Hey, I'm gonna be late. Yeah. Are, are you okay with that? Eh. Not really. <laughs> Even in Atlanta with the traffic? Ah, you knew the traffic was there. Wow. So here, here's the thing about authentic huh? hardwood. Who's a hard ass now? At huh? authentic hardwood, if we tell you you're gonna be there at eight o'clock, open the door. We're there. We don't, <laughs> don't need a doorbell. <laughs> How do you get your people to do that? We they're at my office at six thirty, ready to go. Man, wow. Yeah, no, we we really, 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 really try hard All to right. make sure we do what we say we're going to do. All right, hardwood guy, I want to know this one. Give me a DIY nightmare story. You did something and you almost lit your house on fire. Oh, but I've, I've been through it all. And you, and you told your wife, "Don't worry, baby. I'm a hardwood guy. I I know how to do electrical." Uh, oh, at my house? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I've never really screwed up too bad at the and house. Come on, tough guy. Dude, uh, in fact, we're sitting in our basement. I can give you guys one right now. He doesn't want to give one? I'll give you one. If you look at the back, uh, you can't see it here, but right behind us, I opened up that wall, right? And so my friend was supposed to come over and help me take it down so I could put up an LVO by myself. Well, I was going to have him come over. to. He didn't show. I'm like, screw you. I'm going to do it myself. I got it. So I dropped the wood. I get the LVO up. I step back down. I forgot to clear the wood. I step right on a nail. It goes right through my foot. I get the LVL halfway up. I get a nail in my foot with a two by four underneath it. You're right. I have to keep, I have to kick that thing out so I can get back up and push the LVL back into place so I can get it screwed in place. You had to kick the nail out of your foot. I did. So I just thought of a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I can build you to those. I was drilling, digging holes for footings for a screened in porch. The big auger, two man auger. And we had about nine or 12 of them to do. And we're towards the end. And I drilled down and I hit something. I'm like, what the heck is that? And I realized it's the septic tank. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I said, now we're hitting shit, baby. Now we're talking to you. <laughs> and I said, well, we're not going to put one here. And I just moved over and put one next to it. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. I love that. All right. Michael Kerouac, Authentic Hardwood. You've grown the right business. You've done it the right way. Again, people, it doesn't happen overnight. Welcome to the world of running your own business the right way. We got to keep doing it. Keep going up that mountain. Don't forget, you can always check this podcast out, the Small Business Safari. Don't give us a follow or do. Because <laughs> if you liked it, you got to freaking follow it. All right, man. We're out of here, Alan. We got to go. Cheers, Let's go everybody. Eat. Thank you.